Welcome to Great Business Stories, and today's episode is called Playing With Fire, Ivor Kruger, Business Genius or Master Fraudster. It's a fascinating story, a guy called Ivor Kruger, the most famous Swedish person and probably the most successful business person you've never heard of. In his prime, during the Roaring Twenties, Ivor built up a fortune worth $100 billion in today's money. He invented many of the financial instruments that are still being used to this day. The stocks and bonds of his companies were the most widely held securities in the world. He lent billions to cash-strapped governments and became a personal advisor to the US president. And yet, if you Google him now, he's mentioned in the same breath as Charles Ponzi and Bernie Madoff. Was either a scam artist or one of the most brilliant business minds of the 20th century? Or was he both? I hope you enjoyed this one. And remember, a new episode is released on the first of every month. Good hey, morning, Keith. How are you? Morning, Cayman. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Today, we're going to be talking about Ivor Kruger and the financial scandal of the century is the book that both of us read. Yeah, yeah. It's a book, Frank Hartnoy. That's it. That's the one I yeah. read, you know, The Match King. Um, and I'd never heard of the guy. So obviously, I'm really interested in um, talking about him uh, without <laughs> trying to sound like I'm in awe of the guy and his achievements and drop, walk that fine line between been amazed by the guy and then obviously spoiler alert maybe things didn't end as as well as they could have done but um i guess you it was your choice your story how did how did we come to be talking about ivor by chance really i was looking for a book to read and i came across the financial times you know they have a list of top 20 business books every year and i think this was for 2010 it was one of the choices and i thought I'll give that a go because the title itself was Ivor Kruger, The Financial Scandal of the Century, where they're talking about, you know, it was in the 1920s when this happened. And I was kind of going, I've never heard of this guy. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't even know what financial scandal they're talking about. So then I read a, a little bit of the, the back of the book and it was all this detail about this amazing guy from Sweden who went over to America and raised all these millions and was more than just a mere businessman mm. he, he straddled the world stage financially yeah. lending money to government and i was gone never heard of this guy so obviously it was intriguing um and because i'd read the book prior to this episode i read it a good few months ago i had a bit more time on my hands as well so i also did a bit of research there was a, a good uh, youtube video by uh, professor david goldsmith Mm -hmm. um, on Ivor and Harvard Business School did a case study on him as well. And it is just a fascinating story because you read so much about him. I mean, that we're not giving much away in terms mm -hmm. of spoilers because the clue is in the title, the financial scandal of the century. Yeah. You read so much about this guy and how much he achieved. And then if you Google him and if anybody was to Google him, you would see him compared to Bernie Madoff or, mm -hmm. or Charles Pondy. And yet, when you dig into the story, you realize you know, he wasn't a Bernie Madoff. He wasn't a Charles yeah. Ponzi. There was far much more to him. He was a man of amazing substance. But at the same time, his reputation yeah. tatters because of what happened during his career. So just to give our listeners a very quick overview of, of who this guy was, his name was Ivor Kruger. And he was born in a place called Kalmar in Sweden in 1880. His grandfather had built this huge businesses in weaving paper and matches and his father took over the match business. Mm -hmm. And matches were a huge business um, yeah. back in those times because everybody needed matches. And the Swedes were the uh, biggest producers of what was called the, the safety match. They invented the safety match. whereby And there, there's a particular type of wood as well, I believe, which was um, indigenous to the area, which was a poplar or... It was a particular type of wood. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right on that. And it was a particular type of phosphorus. Before that, apparently, matches, they were made with yellow phosphorus and they could actually light off anything and they could light off themselves. Yeah. And they weren't yeah. very safe. So, yeah, the Swedes came up with this method anyway and they became the, the, the uh, biggest producers of these safety matches. And Ivor was, by all accounts, and, and do jump in, but from the book mm. that I read and other research was, very precocious, but very smart, but also always lived on the edge, even as a boy, always kind of yeah. pushed the envelope a little bit. 
That's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was a bit of a bit of a bold kid as well, I suppose, is how he was. Yeah, yeah. Like Mis- you know, misbehaved and got into quite a bit of trouble. And, yeah. yeah, similar to a lot of very, very successful entrepreneurs. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and then so he got a combined master's degree in mechanical and civil engineering by the time he was 20. And he went over to America, which while it wasn't unusual for a lot of people in Europe to go over to America, most people were going over to seek a better life. Whereas Ivor yes. had a better life in Sweden. You know, he could have taken over the match companies and had a very nice life. They were very wealthy, but it kind of speaks to, I suppose, his ambition and his independence that he wanted to carve his own path. And he was very ambitious and very adventurous. And he spent a year in America, came back with his mm-hmm. tail between his legs, apparently, but then went off traveling around the world to Paris, Egypt, South Africa. He apparently opened up a restaurant in South Africa. It didn't go well. Yeah, no, no, I didn't, I didn't hear that, but I, I, or I didn't notice that part. He did, he was involved in construction projects as well, maybe even as a labor or engineer, or I think he stumbled into being a, an architect by accident, I think, in, in one particular case, but. Um, he would have been involved in the building and construction of the Carlton building in downtown Johannesburg, which is uh, one of the tallest buildings in the world at the time. And uh, I can say that I've been in it. Uh, yeah. And it, it, uh, it's a bit like a, a bunker. So yeah. it's still pretty much the same as, as as it was, I'd imagine. So it's incredible to kind of have, have been there and him being yeah. involved in it and not obviously having any idea of it. Yeah, and and construction is definitely where his career took off. He went back to America and he started working for a a company that was run by Jules Can. They had developed a metal Mm. putting steel and concrete that reinforced it and allowed for much greater loads. And then with the invention of the elevator, it allowed for the construction of skyscrapers. And this is when construction was really taken off in America. So Ivor got the rights for this building method and took it back to Sweden and started a company called Kluger & Toll. Yeah. They were a real progressive, efficient construction company. Apparently, like none other back then, they were the first mm. company, I believe, in Europe to set prices. In other words, they guaranteed that they would be finished a job by a certain day and gave them a price for that day. And on their first big build, they, that's right. He did a deal saying, if we're, for every day that we're late, we pay you, the, cost, the customer, 5,000 krona. But for every day that we're early, you will pay us a bonus of 5,000 krona. And they actually finished the job two months early. So they got a, a nice wow. little bonus and it sealed their reputation. And they continued to grow that company. They floated that company. Within a few years, they were making 200,000 euro profits a year. That's about 20 or 30 million, which for back then was a lot of money. And they were also paying dividends. And this is a key yeah. to the story. He, they were paying dividends of 25% a year, which were the kind of dividends that were unheard of in yeah, most of Europe and definitely in America. And this is key to Ivers, I think, MO. He knew that if I pay out big dividends, I am going to get a lot of investors on board. Yeah. So effectively, over four years, you got the price of your investment back, essentially. Yeah. Isn't that, yeah, so it's huge. It's huge. It's huge. And of course, it's probably, it's probably unsustainable. Uh, it is unsustainable, yeah. as we shall see later on. But anyway, he wasn't going to be happy just running Kruger and Toll. He had much, much bigger ambitions. And around a few oh. years into this with Kruger and Toll, his father's match business was in a bit of trouble. Competition was getting very fierce. Ivor took over the company and he could see that because the margins and matches were so, so thin, that really the only way you could make a go of it is if you had a monopoly. Yeah. And back then, while monopolies were illegal in America as a result of the Sherman Act, in Europe and in most countries around the world, monopolies were still perfectly legal. So Ivor started growing uh, the match business by taking out huge loans from this Swedish bank banking syndicate. And he consolidated the Swedish yeah. match business and bought all his competitors. And also then went into the whole vertigra- vertical integration model where he bought the companies that made the machines for the, cigar- for the match companies, bought the forestries, bought the chemical companies. Yeah. Yeah. So he owned it all and he called this company then Swedish Match. And actually I was looking it up. Swedish Match was is still going and yes, it was only true. sold in twenty twenty two to Philip Morris for sixteen billion. Apologies for the interruption. I'd like to tell you very quickly how we plan to grow great business stories, how you can help us, 
and what you'll get in return. Due to the huge amount of research undertaken for each episode, for now we can release only one episode on the first of every month. But if we can get enough supporters to donate just $3 per month, we'll be able to release a second episode every month. This second monthly episode will be behind a paywall, but your $3 monthly subscription will give you access to these episodes when we eventually release them. So that's what we're building towards. But for now, when you subscribe for $3 a month, you get the following benefits. You get to listen to great business stories without hearing this message. You get access to one bonus episode. It's a cracking story called the $4.5 billion 1MDB heist, how Joe Lowe and the Prime Minister stole a fortune. And finally, as a supporter, on the first of every month, the same day that we release a new episode, you'll get one email with one link to an amazing in-depth article exploring a great story. And while our Twitter feed, which is at biz, B-I-Z, story podcast, regularly shares links to great business stories, the one delivered via email will be a bit special. So to help us release two episodes a month, to listen to that bonus episode, and to receive a link to a great business story article in your inbox once a month, go to greatbusinessstories.supercast.com and there's a link to it in the description. Thank you. Yeah, they diversified into the world of tobacco, I think, and much later, but they were in the match business and they had various different products, I think, over the the course of, of their life. But I think, I think Philip Morris bought them because of Snus, the tobacco product that's very popular in the Nordics, and they didn't stray that far away from their original Swedish roots, obviously. Yeah, I saw that. I was looking up their products and I saw that. Swedish match now they sell cigars they sell that snooze, snooze. Uh, snooze. Uh, uh, snuff is this no no it's it's um it's a little pouch of tobacco that you put uh in your upper lip yeah or you can get loose tobacco it's very popular in, in Sweden I've used it myself yeah 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 I know and I, I'm still looking at those products and I was still thinking god 16 billion they must be selling a lot of that stuff to be uh, bought yeah. out for that amount but anyway so he had by this stage so then Ivor had Swedish match and he Kruger and Toll, and they were both very, very successful. And he also then started expanding into Europe by other match companies. But what he found was that whenever he tried to consolidate, say, Belgium, the Belgian market or whatever market, that as soon as he bought up all the big match manufacturers, that within a few months, smaller competitors yeah. would just start cropping up, undercutting him. So he realized that he needed a monopoly in any country that he was in, that the only way for this match business to work properly was to have monopoly. And of course, the reason why monopolies work for matches as well is that they're what was called an inelastic product. And that means that if you have a monopoly, you can raise the prices and it's not really yes. going to uh, impact your sales because it was a necessary product. People had to buy matches. And the cost per unit is so tiny, I suppose, that even so a tiny. significant increase doesn't feel like a, a huge kind of increase to consumer. Yeah. And around this time, he was like, in some respects, you're, you're, you're reading through this, you're looking at these must be hugely labor intensive negotiations and a bit of strong arming to consolidate these very different markets. And then he was also dabbling in the entertainment business. Was that around this time as well? So it's involved it was, in the yeah. movie business. Yeah. And, and in fairness. Uh, the author does point out that of all the businesses that Ivor was dabbling in, and he was in dabbling, in, dabbling in loads and continued to expand into loads mm -hmm. of different, the movie business, I think it was a passion project for him because yes. he never actually made any money from the movie business, yeah. uh, as very few people do. Um, but he, he did, he got very much involved. He actually founded the Swedish film industry. He's, he's right. down as the, the, the founder of the Swedish film industry. And as a result of that, it was he who discovered a young actress who became known as Greta Garbo. That's and nice. She was a waitress in a restaurant, I think. Yes. Uh, that sounds like a human league song. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and he, um, he, him and her became lifelong friends and, and very, very good friends. They used to uh, meet each other regularly and confide in each other throughout yeah. their lives. And they were, they were very, very close. I suppose back then they were over the course of their careers, the two most 
famous Swedish people in the United States. Yeah, and there's a bit of a scene there as well, I suppose, insofar as both of them like their, their alone time, you know, isn't that yes. Carlo's favorite quote I want to be yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. he, was, he was pretty, pretty fond of kind of taking time away from everybody and retreating into himself and pondering his existence. Yeah, yeah. So that was Ivor anyway, up to now, up to 19... 19, 1920. So he had a huge business expanding. Swedish Match was also paying out div- big dividends, not quite 25%, but still significant dividends. But all this was built on borrowed money from a syndicate of Swedish banks. And mm. they were, or Ivor by this stage, was by far their biggest borrower. And there was uh, a concern that maybe they were overexposed to him. He'd owe them tens of millions. So they did send in a forensic accountant to take a look at his business. But by this stage as well, Ivor had created dozens of subsidiaries and interconnected companies. He was using the money from these companies, basically, even though they were public companies, using them really as his own money as he saw fit. He was uh, gambling an awful lot on foreign currencies. Yeah. And apparently he was quite good at it, at least he said he was, and making a lot of money from it. And he was also using an awful lot of off-balance sheets and mark-to-market accounting practices and all this made it really difficult for the forensic accountant to get a grip on his business. And he actually had to go back to the bankers and say, I can't actually value everything in this business because there's so much complexity in here. And he also said to the bankers, there's a big risk here in that Ivor has total control. Yeah. And it wasn't that he had any suspicions of Ivor. It was just a case that if it's a risk. Yeah, the risk. If anything were to happen to Ivor, we need more oversight here. We need more regulation here. But the lead banker of the syndicate was a guy called Oscar Rydbeck. And he was one of um, Ivor's original backers. He sat on the boards of his company, very close to Ivor. And he convinced the bankers that regulation wouldn't be such a good idea. And maybe they'd be better off letting Ivor be Ivor because he was uh, pretty much a very impressive and a very genius. He was really seen as this amazingly clever businessman. And the bankers, because they were making money from the interest repayments that Ivor was making, and also because most of them were shareholders in his company and they were making huge dividends, they kind of went, yeah, let's, let's just leave Ivor off on his own. Yeah, and I suppose we have to be careful when you're looking at a story like this, not to judge what's acceptable by the standards of today and what is common by the standards today. Because you're reading the book and you're thinking, you know, the statement, financial statements and the information he provided seemed so brief and so blunt that it's outrageous that he was able to get away with this. But in a lot of respects, that was, you know, par for the course. Yeah. And, in fairness, yeah, and in fairness to the author, Frank Parker, he, he does make that clear that all these companies that were on the New York Stock Exchange, most of them didn't publish accounts. And when they did, it was as brief as Ivers and Ivers published accounts sometimes we just have two lines with sales and then with the income from sales. Other revenue or other yeah. income or something. Yeah. Income from other sources. And that would be it. Yeah. Be, and when he was asked about what are these other sources, it was like, well, some of it is from the foreign currency exchanges that I do. Some of it from some assets that I would have sold. But it wasn't in the accounts. And you got away with it back then. There was yeah. very much, uh, when you say light regulation, there was no regulation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 So what Ivor was doing, you're right. What Ivor was doing was very much in line with what was par for the course back then. Yeah. Yeah. So, of course, because he had, he was so indebted to these Swedish banks, they, they couldn't give him any more money anyway. And his ambitions were too big for just what he was doing. He wanted to raise lots of more money. He wanted to expand far, far bigger and quicker. So, of course, he set his sight on the US. And this was the early 1920s. The U.S. was booming. It was called the Roaring Twenties for a reason. I had some figures here. They were selling over 4 million cars a year. There was 15 million cars on the road by the early 20s. And of course, with all these cars came huge investment in roads and infrastructure, Mm. technologies like traffic lights. There was roadside restaurants, motels, gas stations. It's a huge amount of progress and and, and investment going on. A lot of what we probably realize as or recognize today as, as... as being found with the foundations were put in there. Yeah. I, I guess when you look at what changed then, um, and again, you know, cre- credit to Frank Partnoy, um, 
he credits a lot of this to um, the interest in or interest by the common consumer in the stock market and how common it became for the ordinary consumer on the street to buy shares and to speculate and to trade and to understand um, share trading and working with brokers, even, you know, people who wouldn't necessarily be considered particularly wealthy at the time. Yeah, because of all this investment and growth, there was a, a real increase in wealth and consumerism. And so with this extra money, you're right, members of the public started getting involved and getting interested in shares. And there was more day traders back then than ever before in the history of America, apparently. So it was huge. America was booming. And Ivor had studied history and he knew that this wouldn't last, but he knew that there was money to be made and money to be raised while it did last. So he went over to America with a really, I thought reading it, it was a really good plan. He met up with a company called uh, Lee Higginson, which were a conservative investment banker who were keen to get in on this boom mm -hmm. time in America. And the author goes into great detail describing how Ivor prepared for this meeting, the poise he had during this meeting. Yes. Ivor apparently employed pauses very, very effectively when he met people. He'd look them in the eye. He'd take his time before he answered a question. He was very, very careful, but he also prepared really, really well in that he'd never have any notes when he did this presentation to the investment bank. No notes, but every fact and figure that he gave when it was double checked by whatever junior assistants to see if he was right, everything was correct. He, he knew it. Yes. So the plan. But of course, this wasn't ju just to be just for one thing. This wasn't his first trip to America in terms right. of trying to start a business and establish a business. You're right. This is a part that I found fascinating. Yeah. yeah. That he'd actually tried this before and failed. Yeah, you're right. He had a different plan. Back in 1919, right. he went over to America with a view to merge his match business with the largest match uh, business in America. And two things happened there. First of all, the match business in America treated him as a junior partner, which was only right because Ivor had no real footprint in the American uh, market. And Ivor got very miffed about this, that, you know, how dare this guy treat me as a junior partner. But another thing then is when they were in negotiations, mm. Cooper were, did an audit on Ivor's business and they found irregularities in the finances of his business and they weren't able to certify his accounts. So Ivor very much retreated from America with his tail between his legs back then and never mentioned that episode to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. So when, when, he, when he came back, he made sure he nailed it. Oh, he nailed it. And he nailed, and he nailed it with a different plan. This plan that he uh, presented to the Lee Higginson Investment Board wasn't a plan to create a business in America. This was a far, far better plan. His plan now was to raise money in America using the boom that was going on at the moment. And as you said, all the interest from normal people who were buying shares to raise money, to use this money then to lend to governments in Europe because there was still a huge hangover from World War I and an awful lot of countries were still in financially they were in dire straits. So his idea was we lend money to these governments in exchange for these loans these governments will give us monopolies of the match market not only will the governments get their loans but also we will uh, give them a percentage of the profits from the monopolies it's a really really nice plan and the way he presented this and the way he held himself and his knowledge and expertise and one thing that's important to say about Ivor as well even though he was this charismatic enigmatic type of figure Everybody mentioned how humble he was and how he seemed to have no ego. He wasn't one of these brash uh, types. He came across very humble, no ego. So the bankers in Lee Higginson loved his plan. But the, the Paris that Ivor was holding in front of them was that he was giving them the opportunity to become these financiers on the world stage. And up yeah. to now, the big beast on the world financial market was J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan was the company who was lending to governments all over the world. And now Ivor was presenting I, Lee Higginson with this opportunity to take on JP Morgan and to become this preeminent financial. Yeah, business. yeah. And, and, and for our listeners, it's important to say there's a good reason why you haven't heard of Lee Higginson. 
And, you know, the, you've heard of J.P. Morgan, um, but we, we'll get to that in a, in a little while, I'm, I'm guessing. There's actually a very funny section um, in the book about Morgan um, and an exchange with Jack Morgan, who's J.P. Morgan's son, who was running the bank at the time, and his son. And while there was various different huge uh, developments happening in Europe in terms of loans, um, the only exchange that they published was about the purchase and commissioning of a yacht. Yeah. <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, uh, either singular focus on, you know, financial matters and the two guys just speaking about a boat. It's just hilarious. Actually. It is. But that's the thing. They, your man mentioned in the book, uh, Frank Partner, you mentioned the book. He said, here about Morgan was by this stage. Or, well, his name must be John Pierpoint Morgan, J.P. Yeah. Morgan. Yeah, yeah, he was dead by this stage, and you're right. Jack, his son, was was really considered a pale shadow of his father. Yeah, having said that, though, J.P. Morgan still had the top people working for them. But Jack, or, Jack Morgan doesn't come off good. <laughs> no, it's, it's quite funny, actually. But in the middle of all the seriousness, yeah, yeah. So obviously, Lee Higginson jumped on board with Ivor. They were so mm. keen to 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 go ahead with his plan, and straight off the raised $15 million in their first round and created a company called International Match. Apparently it was the hottest IPO of the year. The book goes into great detail about this another aspect of Ivor that he created financial instruments that are yes. still used today. Yeah, the B-share, I think, is is one of the big long-standing ones, right? The B-share, whereby people could buy shares, but they had minimal vote, like a tiny voting rights or little or no voting rights, which suited Ivor because he wanted yeah. to hold on to control. He also invented, uh, what was this, convertible gold debentures. These were shares That's right. inverted at a future date, if you wanted, and they also paid dividends. He invented American depository receipts which was a way in which foreign investors could invest into American companies back then. So he had all these financial instruments as well. So he was very, very um, progressive yeah. in, in, in his dealing. So they raised the first 15 million and then the pressure was on Ivor to use this money to lend to a government. And he did. He was negotiating with several governments at that time. And eventually within a year, by 1924, he landed the Polish government. Mm. He gave them a loan of 6 million at 7% for a monopoly on the production. Now, he later then got another loan to them for $25 million to give them a monopoly on the sales and distribution. But the success of landing the Polish government got huge publicity for, for yeah. Oliver because he was, he was delivering on his promises and he was paying off these big dividends to his shareholders and everything was good except for one key thing that came out of this deal with the Polish government. After he did the deal with the Polish government, he got these people to make a rubber stamp of the signatories on yes. the deal. And apparently, it didn't say this in the book, but apparently he did this then for every other deal he did with the governments thereafter. He got the signatories that were on the treasury bills that he signed, he got them copied onto these rubber stamps. Now, he apparently these were never used, but you've got to start wondering, why are you doing this, Ivor? Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's to put up the equivalent of a, you know, a golden disc in your hallway to show no. visitors or something somewhere. No, oh, no. So, so that he got the Polish deal, and then over the next few years, they raised the equivalent of about three hundred million in loans, which is fifteen billion in today's money. But again, remember back then there wasn't as much money in circulation. Fifteen billion is a huge amount of money, and just. Give an idea of some of the countries. He got Ecuador for three million, or gave them three million, mm-hmm. Yugoslavia, twenty-two million, Hungary, thirty-six million, Latvia, six million, Romania, thirty million, Lithuania, six million, additional twenty-five million to Poland, and then France and Germany, which we'll get on to because they were Yeah, the around. French one was was incredible, actually. The French one was incredible. The French one was really the one that put his name up there. Uh, yeah, and, you know, this was the the big, big break. But while he was doing all that, and I'll, I'll get to the French one in a minute, while he was doing all that, he was also creating all these other subsidiaries and companies. By the end of it all, he had 225 subsidiaries. He was moving money around between Switzerland and Liechtenstein, get tax breaks. Um, he was also gambling heavily on foreign currencies. But again, as you said, nothing, he was doing nothing illegal here. And his investors knew about these foreign currency gambles. They knew about the Liechtenstein 
company for tax breaks and they applauded it because they thought, yeah, well, that's what Ivor does and he's making us loads of money and there wasn't anything really wrong in a lot. Yeah, I guess as long as the dividends are coming. That was it. You you don't ask any questions. That's it. And, And again, when they asked Ivor for information on some of the deals that he was doing, he said, no, he said, these are confidential. And an awful lot of them in fairness war because you're not dealing business to business here. You're dealing business to government. And there was a lot more secrecy involved when you were dealing with politicians. So they took that as, okay, no problem. And in fairness, when they did, they, they weren't suspicious, but they wanted to do their own due diligence. And they did send, I think it was a Percy Rockefeller, a scion of the Rockefeller family who had experience in the match business. They sent him over to Sweden just to have a look at Ivor's operations. And he came back with blowing accounts. Yeah. Ivor's businesses were legitimate. They were making huge amounts of money. Yeah, and yeah. It was a substantial kind of yeah. uh, genuine force of business. He was, and his loans to the government were legitimate. And he was getting monopolies in all these countries. So the, everything was going well for uh, Ivor. And mm. then, as you mentioned there, the France deal. The France deal was in 1927, where he lent 70 million to um, the French government. Um, and J.P. Morgan had been the lender to the French government. So this was yeah. a big, big deal. It's a coup. And it was a big coup. It was a big coup. And France actually honoured him with the uh, the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honour. And normally in these kind of ceremonies, whoever gets that uh, honour will turn up at the ceremony in all their medal. And Ivor turned up with just one simple medal on him. And when he was asked by the media, what is this medal? He just simply said, well, it's just a, a medal to commemorate the uh, Swedish Olympic Games in 1912. And that's all he yeah, said. Which was, yeah, which he was instrumental in, in, in establishing, right? Well, he financed the whole Olympic Games, but yeah. he didn't say that to the media. And then the media found that out. And that only enhanced his reputation for being this really humble, humble guy who doesn't like to brag about what he has. So it really elevated him. By this stage, after the French deal, his reputation was... Through the route. Yeah. And the interesting thing as well is you're thinking, you know, he's running his businesses. He's spending a huge amount of time um, across the different businesses from the match business right across to the finance business. But he's also buying swathes of, of other businesses, right? So he's, he, he's buying property, he's buying art. It just seems frenetic. I've got it here. I've got a list, actually. Interesting you should mention that because I made a list just to sort of give the listeners an idea of what he had by this stage. So by this stage, he was estimated to be worth about $100 billion. Um, dollars. So he's thought to be about the third richest man in the world. Swedish Match had 26,000 mm. employees in operations in 90 countries. They had match monopolies in 24 countries and near monopolies in many more. And they controlled 75% of the match business worldwide. He owned banks. He owned mm-hmm. Ericsson, the telecommunication company. Yeah. He owned mines all over the world. He controlled half of the international market in iron ore. Between 1923 and 1929, the value of international match had soared by 1100%. And because of all this, his reputation was such that he was now mixing it with world leaders and he became a trusted advisor to Herbert Hoover. So yeah. like. I don't know if Time Magazine did Man of or Person of the Year back then, but if they had, I'm pretty sure Ivor would have made the cover. They did. He he was featured in a few magazines, all right. You've seen this as colossus yeah. of business. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think the fact that he was international and yet made himself available um, to the president of the United States to advise them on geopolitics, as well as an interesting one. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, like he was a colossal. He He was the preeminent businessman. And he was everywhere, as you said. He was buying businesses everywhere. There was even stories of his auditor. And I mentioned his banks sent somebody over just to do due diligence. He did actually have an American auditor. Uh, It was Ernest and Ernest were the company. And it was a a young guy, uh, A.D. Burning, who was the auditor. And this poor guy, like he was junior when he first came on board as the auditor and rightly so, because by this stage, Ivor had only landed in America and most of his businesses were going to be in Europe anyway. So Ernest and Ernest didn't think that they'd need anybody senior. But of course, Ivor's, uh, the more money they raised, mm. the busier this poor auditor became. And he was just stressed out asking Ivor questions all the time and Ivor just either ignoring him or giving him big answers. 
Uh, and the auditor anyway became very compromised because Iber did still yes. need this guy to certify his account. So Iber sent him and his wife off on luxurious Fipsy Europe. Fip- Fipsy Fipsy Europe. Europe. Uh, and there was the book goes into good detail about this young auditor, like waiting for Iber to get back to him with his details of this trip to Europe. So he could tell his wife, <laughs> gave him then, I think, shares worth a year's salary. Iber then kept on putting more business towards Ernest and Ernest. They were doing consultancy work for him, taxation work for him. That's right. So, of course, they became compromised as well. And it ended up with this auditor really was more on Iver's side and was helping Iver kind of cover over the cracks that were well, appearing. Yeah, yeah. He would write the memos and, and send them on to Iver and say, does this look okay? Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and, and then he'd get a, a telegram back and it pushed up. That that was a common way of communications then, um, but I, Iver seems to have been, I wouldn't say cruel, but this this poor auditor obviously was was um, starstruck by Ivar. There was a but, huge uh, imbalance of power, I think. There, yeah, and and Ivar go out of his way to try and avoid this guy. Come to Europe yeah. and meet me in Paris. Oh no, sorry, yeah. I've gone back to Sweden. They hop over to Sweden. Oh, and gone back to Paris again. Yeah. And God only knows where he actually was. That's um, this. Yeah, that's, but, but as you say, this guy went and looked and examined the substance of, of the assets as well, actually. He did. He did go over to Sweden as well and met with the Swedish auditors. And the Swedish auditors he found were very professional. But there was just so much detail and so much complexity in the business that it was impossible for him to get to the bottom of it. And Ivor was the only one who knew where... All the bodies were buried, I suppose, and he just, he wasn't going to give all those details away. Yeah. And so the auditor did start papering over the cracks because the cracks were beginning to appear. Apparently, in some of the monopolies that Ivor had secured, I read this in another source now, not in Frank Partnoy's book, he had secured them at too high a price in that some of the deals he made with the governments promised them maybe a bit too much back that didn't make the monopolies profitable. And in other countries where he didn't have monopoly, apparently, he was selling his matches at a loss to keep the Russians out because the Russians were undercutting the yeah. North markets. So in short, this is the crux really of what was happening with Ivor at that time and maybe throughout the years was that his companies weren't making enough money to pay the high dividends. Yeah. 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 So in other words, he was subsidizing the dividends out of capital, not, not out of earnings. And that's why he was in this cycle now where he needed to keep raising money so that he could keep paying out these big dividends so he could keep up this facade that his businesses were far more successful than they probably were. And probably where the comparison to Ponzi comes from then. So really, I, I need to craft a narrative beyond reality, really. So I'm yeah. using borrowings to pay out dividends that demonstrate the success of my business as opposed to the companies actually generating yeah. enough to pay the dividends in the first place. Yeah, and, and it, it, it's a fair it's a fair comparison in a way that there was a Ponzi-like thing going on here. It's just that mostly with Ponzi schemes, there's no substance behind them yeah. at all, whereas Ivor had a ton of substance. Like, he yes. was a businessman, but he was doing shady shit, and this is what happened. And what do you think is... His biggest mistake was Ivor, I think, was just being Ivor. And his biggest mistake was always having to portray this image that he was being successful all the time and that he could afford to pay out all these dividends. And that was the thing that was going on for years. But I suppose the biggest mistake he made then was he went ahead. And if we go back to this time, it was 1929 now, it was September, shares were starting to fall there was a bit of a the market was getting a bit um bit shaky and Ivor's shares were still yes. holding pretty well but then on the week starting October 24th he'd been in negotiations with the German government to lend them 125 million dollars and the market was tanking now this was just near the end of October and this was a time really where Ivor should have just stood back and said okay the markets here are a bit shaky now is not the right time to be lending $125 million to the German government. Now, the October 21st was a really bad week. And it actually, uh, it was so bad that the market closed that Friday and Saturday for trading. 
And yet on October 26th, Ivor signed the deal with Germany to lend them $125 million. And the following Monday and Tuesday became known as Black Monday and Black Tuesday. So Ivor, that was a time where Ivor really should have just stood back and said, okay, this is too much. I got it. But, yeah, but I guess in fairness to him, hadn't the French redeemed their loan or uh, paid their loan back early? Yes, but not by this stage. Really? No, no, no. By the stage that he made the commitment to Germany, France still more is France had t- taken the loan out in 1927. This is only 1929. So this is where things get a bit suspicious. And Frank Partnoy does raise suspicions here. So Ivor did the deal with Germany, which was reckless, but also he wanted to continue to create this aura of conflict. Like he's above all this. His businesses are above all the, the stuff that's going on in the stock market. He did the deal with Germany. Now he had to come up with the first tranche of 50 million. Uh, he didn't have it. And then just a month or two before he had to pay the first tranche to Germany, France came up to him and said, we're paying back all the 70 million you gave us just two years ago. And not only that, part of that deal he did with France, because Ivor did strike amazing deals, was that yeah. as well as paying interest on the 70 million, France also had agreed that when they paid back the 70 million, they would actually end up paying back 75 million. So yes. all of a sudden, just when he needed the money the more, France paid him back 75 million. Now, as the author said, he was either very lucky yes. or something else happened there. And Time magazine actually ran an article after France gave him the money back, throwing huge shade and an awful lot of skepticism on the timing of that payment. Really? Yeah. But and what, was, no, what was the inference that there was? So wasn't any inference. The, the, that right. was the thing. But the author, Frank Partney, all, all he said was that it was very coincidental. And then he mentioned the Time magazine article being very skeptical, but I couldn't find the article and mm. I couldn't get the gist of what they were skeptical about. But obviously the suggestion is that somebody got a lot of money mm-hmm. to ensure that yeah. Ivor got his 75 million back so that he could. Just when he needed it. it. Just when he needed it. But of course, you know, things were catching up on him now. Things were, were going south. Um, but having said that, Ivor's shares compared to the share price on uh, shares of other companies on the stock exchange were still doing pretty okay at that time. They weren't tanking as badly as yeah, yeah. other as other companies, but he was still coming under huge pressure. But that's and probably on the promise of the dividend though, right? So the promise is the safe haven. This, this, and not only did Ivor go ahead with the German deal, while the, ma- while the markets were tanking, he came out and increased his dividend payment to his uh, shareholders. Again, to give the air of confidence that he was doing okay, stick with me, everything is okay. But of course, if he wasn't able to pay the dividends before the crash, yeah. there's no way that he was going to be able to pay the dividends while the market was tanking and everybody was, was suffering. And then, of course, there was the Italian deal. And this was the one, this is in 1930. Mm-hmm. You'd been courting the Italians for a long time. And I'd be interested to get your take on this because the nub of it is that it was very top secret. He didn't even tell his fellow directors where he was going. He just said, I'm dealing with country X. He didn't tell his fellow yes. directors who he was meeting, where he was traveling to. But we do know that he met with the Minister of Finance a few times with another senior official and that he had one or two meetings with Mussolini. We do know that nothing public ever came out of that. Yeah. And we do know that Ivor came back from those meetings with Italy and he had a copy of an Italian treasury bill that he took to the printers that printed his treasury bill and he asked them to make 42 forged copies of those treasury yes. bills with the dates on them that were compatible with the dates that he met the Minister for Finance and this other top official. And then Ivor crudely signed all these bills with those two government officials' names, mm. very crudely, apparently misspelled them in some occasions, and then locked them away in a state. In a state. Yeah. 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 Which is really puzzling behavior. It's very strange. It's very strange. Now, again, but at the same time, he made those rubber stamps of signatures and nothing was ever done with them either. And yeah. Yeah. It's it's very strange behavior, and there's not enough meat on the bones really from the book or from any source no, that I not. had to sort of give an idea as to what was going on here. Why was he doing this? Um, but just 
park that for a second. We will get back to the Italian one because it does come up. So he made these signatures, these forged treasury bills, and he put them in a safe, locked them away, didn't show them to anyone. But then in 1931, he was under huge financial pressure and he was selling Ericsson to the American conglomerate IT and T. That's right. Uh, just just a side note on that. Um, yeah, I worked for Ericsson for two years, you, yeah. and part of part of the induction is to learn about the history of Ericsson. I was thinking about this as I was reading the book. His ownership and involvement in the company, to the best of my knowledge, was not mentioned at all. But the tips, no, no. So I, I think that's interesting because he he effectively owned and controlled the company and was trying to sell it at this time. He did. Uh, he bought this in 27, or he bought into it in 1927 and effectively took control of it by 1929, I think. Yeah, and that, that was also, I suppose, to a certain extent, following that monopolistic thread across Europe as well. Maybe he thought he could jump on because he was a fan of technology. He was a big user yeah. of the Telegram. Um, as you'll see from the book, he was monopolizing the Telegraph um, well, facilities on the boat and he seemed like an incredible guy as he was traveling out to the States. So he was, a, he was into technology, I guess, or the technology as it was at the time. Yeah. So I just, I just thought it was fascinating that they never mentioned him. Never mentioned him to the best of my knowledge. God. I suppose it was probably only a blip in that he seemed to only own, own them for like two or three years anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but still it would make an interesting little chapter in the Ericsson uh, yeah. biography. They did include it. So yeah, he tried to sell it to it and and they, again, the book really details the, his poise at these meetings. And they'd ask him questions and there was only either, it would be either in a room with maybe a dozen Ericsson executives. Yeah. He had all his facts and figures again, no notes, off by heart. When they got to check them, everything was correct. They'd ask him questions and the author talked about how Ivor would take a cigarette out, roll it in his fingers, mm. light it smoke it, it could be five to six minutes before he even thought about answering a question, which invariably led one of the Ericsson people to jump in before Ivor answered, go in some sort of answer that would then mould the way Ivor answered his oh. own question. But they were amazed by his poise. And they came up with a deal whereby they advanced Ivor 11 million, but yeah. they, would, they also said that we had got to do an audit on Ericsson. Yeah. And when Pricewaterhouse Cooper did their audit on Ericsson. It wasn't quite as Ivor had said. Now, apparently from the book, Ivor wasn't caught out in a lie. There was an issue with a mistranslation as to when Ivor, what cash in the bank means in Sweden and what cash in the bank means in America, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. Whatever happened was the deal fell true. So it and T said, we're not going ahead with this. We want that 11 million back. Ivor had no problem. He was very calm. Yeah, you'll get it back. But secretly he was under huge pressure. Yeah. And there was good insight from his secretary who told of Ivor smoking more, drinking more, spending yeah. hours and hours in his office, pacing it and talking to himself. So he was, yes. yeah, uh, yeah, he was sad. Uh, exhibit the signs of stress, I suppose, at that point. Yeah, yeah. And, which is and understandable. He, which is understandable. He was under huge pressure. He, he, was, he was held up as the savior of Europe. He was helping out governments left, right and center. He was the preeminent businessman. And yes. It was all built on very, very shaky foundations that were all about come crumbling down on him now. And he did have a nervous breakdown. And while he had this nervous breakdown, his fellow directors were desperately scrambling to try and get some money mm. together to keep the companies going. And they went into his office and they went into his safe. And lo and behold, they found these Italian treasury bills that were worth 140 million. So they rang up the Swedish prime minister who owed Ivor a few favors and said, look, yeah. we have these bills. They're worth 140 million. Can you get onto the banks and just tell them to hoard us some money? So on the back of that, he did get onto the banks, the prime minister. They did lend them a bit of money that kept them going for another few months. But of course, the Italian treasury bills just raised more answers yeah. or more questions. Yeah. Um, and, and that was sort of the beginning of the end, really. It was. It was, that was really it for Ivor because his bankers in both America and Sweden wanted answers. They wanted yeah. answers to what was going on here because there was rumors going around as well that there was significant shortfalls in the company accounts. Ivor, of course, was blaming short sellers and media. Whenever you hear somebody going yes. out blaming yes. short sellers <laughs> and media, 
you always know that they're in trouble. So they wanted to meet up with Ivor and they arranged to meet up with him on March the 12th, 1932 in Paris. They all met in a hotel. Ivor didn't show up. He ended up shooting himself through the heart in his Parisian yeah. apartment. And he left behind three letters, one to a very good friend of his who was also a fellow director and he was the man who found the body. And in his letter, Ivor basically said, I messed up. And this is the best way out. It's a very short letter. Yeah, right. The details yeah. of it are published in the book. The second letter was to his broker, just with instructions on how to, on selling various shares. And the third letter was to one of his sisters. And the contents of that letter were never revealed. Never published. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and then of course, I guess in any event like this, there's going to be some speculation around, you know, and there was speculation at the time. Was this suicide? Was this murder? Uh, did uh, Ivar fake his own death in the school? Yes. And had he been cited? And and I thought that was quite an interesting sort of thread. That is inevitable, I suppose. And in, in, it's inevitable in the death of any you know colossus like this. Yeah, and I, I did follow some of those threads uh, outside of the book as well because I know Ivar's brother maintained up until the very end that Ivar was murdered. Um. And he wrote a book about it as well. Yeah. But based on everything that I read on it, there was a lot of speculation, a lot of conjecture. But like with an awful lot of these conspiracies, there wasn't a whole load of actual. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I guess the guys who found the body were a little bit sort of, but as you would expect, they're in shock. So the recollection of the circumstances were a yeah. bit muddled questionable as well so the rifle that he used or gun he used went from one hand to the other his left hand went to his right yeah. hand or he had a shortened index finger i think so he yeah he, he couldn't have pulled the trigger on that and it was, he you know, he, yeah he didn't open which was common at the time bizarre and a, a glass a coffin a yeah. glass lid on the coffin to allow you to pay, pay your final respects course the bodies and look at anything like him and so i guess this mystique sort of uh, emerges around the death of, of somebody this famous and, and this well known it does it does and, and it adds to the story a little bit but i my my conclusion is that Iver did kill himself and that really was Iver. And, yeah and tragic really it was tragic. And the initial reaction to it worldwide was one of deep grief. The media had loved Ivor. The public had loved Ivor. And, and not just the public in America, his shareholders. Like He had lent money to governments that were in need. And this money was put to build roads to help these countries out. And so the initial shock at his death and the grief was genuine. And people were very upset about his death. And uh, there was great obituaries written. But then within mm -hmm. two weeks, Price Waterhouse Cooper had come out and said that he all his companies were insolvent and he had debts of over two billion krona, which was more than the Swedish national debt. Now apparently they had jumped the gun a little bit because there was no way yes. they could have figured out everything yeah, the driver yeah. had within two weeks because there was such a spider web of companies and interconnected companies and assets and money everywhere that they were wrong on that. There was a lot more value in Ivor's businesses than they had initially thought. And it comes out in the wash later. You know, he had a lot of really, really good assets. He had 5 million acres of forestry. He had all that iron ore. The loans to the government were very real. The interest repayments that Germany were making were 3.75 mm -hmm. million every six months. And they continued throughout the Third Reich. Throughout yeah, World that's War right. II. And they actually went up to 1983. They finished off paying off that loan. So there was a lot of value in the, his company, but it did take 13 years. And we will go back now to the securities acts and all that but his investors eventually at the end of a 13 year process got something like 32 cent on the dollar and the author reckons they would have got about 50 cent on the dollar if there hadn't been such a fire sale of all his yeah acting. yeah which is understandable i suppose yeah fire sales yeah. happen after crashes you know yeah but, but even if they had got 50 cent on the dollar which the author reckons they would have put out the fire sales he said that's very much in line with what any company would have been worth after the crash, you know, that length of time, even after mm. the crash. So there was a lot of value there, but I suppose the key thing that really 
downed Ivor and that that scars his reputation and that when you look him up on Google now you'll just see Ponzi scheme was the Italian the forged, forged, yeah, yeah, forged yeah. Italian treasury bills. And and just out of curiosity, I don't know if you managed to get to the bottom of that. The thirty cent on the dollar that investors got back. Yeah. Was that was based purely on the sale of the assets, right? But but if you think about it, if you'd been an investor for more than four years, arguably you would have got your principal back to the dividend pay. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't dig into that, but you're right. If they were getting that amount of dividends every year. Now, 25% was on the high end. And that was for Kruger. Yeah. Tour. The international match people, the author just said that they didn't get 25%, but they, he just said it was close to that. I don't know why he wasn't able to get the exact figure. So they were probably maybe getting, you know, 20, 21%. But you're right. After a few years, they would have got close to getting all their money back anyway. You know, so yeah. the, so so some people probably, you know, made out, broke yeah. even, made out yeah. fine. Yeah. Probably and like any Ponzi scheme. We people who get in early. But, but then if you contrast it against the return for everybody else who, who lived through the 20s and invested in other companies. Yeah. You know, that's you the extraordinary that. thing about it. That is it. That is it. Like, that's, that's the thing about Ivor. Yes, there was a Ponzi-like element to what he did. But overall, there was enough substance behind what he was doing. There was enough brilliance in him that he had built yeah. these huge businesses that really, as you said, if you, if you looked at this, they probably didn't do as badly as anybody else that had invested in other companies that didn't have any Ponzi-like element attached to them. Yes, yeah, yeah. But the Italian I, I, 40. It, yeah, and and... Who knows what his motivation was in, in doing that? And I guess he wasn't, as you said, the person who 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 found them. Obviously, he didn't have to find them if he knew where they were, but he didn't produce them, I suppose, at the yeah. time of greatest need. And we will never know what he would have done. That's it. It was his fellow directors who found them and used them as collateral. He he didn't, in the same way that he didn't use those rubber stamps that he made of all those other people's signatures. But it does put the big question mark over yeah. why did you do it then? Uh, yes. And the crash of his company came to be known as the Kruger crash. And it led to Congress holding hearings. And out of those hearings came the 1933 and 1934 Securities Act. I always assumed that those Security Acts came as a result of the 1929 crash, but they were actually as a result of Ivor Kruger. And they're the foundation of modern day regulations. Stuff such as uh, general uh, acceptable accounting practices or GAP came out of that. Stuff like public companies have to submit detailed audited accounts quarterly. Stuff like companies could be sued for, for fraud. So it's the end of let's say fair regulation. And the proof in, is in the pudding in that 250 pages of those securities acts are dedicated to Ivor. So it was him that called the security acts to be. Uh, in is, is that his lasting legacy then? Probably, probably, mm. probably, which is a bad legacy, but I'm sure Ivor would have much preferred to have a different <laughs> thing. Because I, I don't know, what, what's your take on it? Because as I said, when you Google him, he put in a category with Bernie Madoff and Charles Ponzi. And I don't think yeah, that. Yeah, and I think, I think it's fundamentally unfair because he's a creator, right? He's yeah. created and disrupted, he's, he's invented financial instruments and classes of shares is he's a tragic figure obviously not just because of the way the circumstances ended um but i think you know one of the other themes in the book is he had all of these properties throughout the world but he'd have these silence rooms or rooms of silence in which he'd retreat so he was obviously a, a tortured man yeah who had a labyrinthine sort of spider web of information to process in an era when you didn't have a computer to do it. He obviously was working at arms and shall we say from his auditors and his banks. So the burden, the mental burden of what he was trying to carry around must have been immense on him. And he had a very small circle of friends. Yes. But I just think it, it's a tale of an incredibly talented, ambitious man who just ended in tragedy. Yeah, that's the impression I get. And it's interesting you should say the quiet rooms he had and, and the life he led. 
he didn't seem to have anybody really. He had no, no partner, no real, real friends. Like he kept everybody at a distance and he came across very much like Greta Garbo, his very good friend, yeah. as, as a very lonely figure. And it is a tragedy because I hadn't heard of him before. And when I did do any bit of research, as I said, he now is compared to these great swindlers. Whereas if he had just stayed on the straight and narrow, he could be somebody that we had heard of before as being one of the great financiers and one of the great businessmen of the 20th century. But now he's just a footnote thrown in with the likes of Charles Ponzi and Bernie Madoff. Yeah. And, and when you dig into the detail, you find out that there was so much more to him than that. So it is very tragic. Yeah, and I think if we if we think about what he left behind, you know, uh, SCA, I was reading about those guys, so that they're they're still in existence. They make yeah. toilet tissue and and wood pulp. Erickson is still around. The Mayans yeah. are still around, as I mentioned. The even match still. So 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 there's a legacy of real substance there. Yeah, um, but his legacy is is tarnished. tainted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A tra tragic ending. Yeah. So look, good story. Well worth looking into. They, they're the kind of ones that I really like in that I've never heard of it before. So that I Yeah, think I think it was a great discovery, actually. So kudos yeah. on that one. Yeah. All right. It'll be a hard one to follow. All right. But you got something right. for us? I do. Yeah, I do. I'll, I'm keeping my powder dry. I've started reading uh, already. Uh, just trying to get ahead of you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, it should be an interesting one. I think it's got to be a contentious one this time. Lovely. All right. Cool. Good luck, Keith. Right. Here's thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.